you know, if you think about this just right, I mean, it's kind of exciting. The last president we had who kind of launched and founded a university was probably Jefferson. So, <laughs> Okay. Oh, you can't really call it a university. <laughs> <laughs> wait, wait, did you say launched and failed in the university? Found it. Found it. I'm just throwing it out there because, what the hell? Um, no, anyway. Um, you know, first off, uh, Randy, Leo, I want to thank you guys uh, for this conversation. And, you know, Randy, you and I have always talked about this that I think there's too many places in this town where you huddle with your friends. If you win, you. You cheer and, and table dance with your friends. And if you lose, or, and one of the things I like about um, the Shanker Institute and the way that you guys engage on this stuff is you and I disagree on a whole hell of a lot. Um, but I think we're all better off when we're disagreeing uh, constructively and civilly and sitting down and talking it through. So uh, Leo and Randy just want to kind of put that out there. Two, you know, one of the things I truly hate about this town uh, is the degree to which it's front running. Um, you know, the, I, I just want to remind all of, like the reporters and kind of like access seeking lapdogs at the foundations and stuff that Catherine is exactly as smart today as she was nine days ago. And I am no smarter than I was nine days ago. And so the number of people who suddenly uh, feel that they really want to listen and have a, a heartfelt talk about things, look, it's just, it's just sad. You know, we can all do better at actually trying to hold to principle and actually trying to listen to and respect ideas whether or not those ideas are espoused by people who happen to hold the majority of the White House. And I just think we have failed miserably on that count. Um, we have made intellectual integrity and intellectual rigor and honest debate a, uh, a handmaiden of partisan advantage. And I think everybody's guilty of it and I'd like to see us do better going forward. Um, what's Trump's victory mean with the Electoral College victory? I mean, right, he lost by several hundred thousand on the popular vote. Um, well, yeah, I mean, it keeps getting tallied. Although, right, part of this, I mean, right, this, this is, uh, you know, Newt, New, who is all over the place in these things, did point out that, right, this whole thing is run in California, and of course the Republicans made zero effort in California, because why would they? And so there's, and, and frankly, if California succeeds, uh, succeeds from the union, which They've now got the petition. Uh, Democrats in the other 49 states need to get a little nervous. But we'll, we'll, we'll see how that goes. Um, but look, the more fundamental issue is nobody really knows what Trump administration's about. Uh, those of us who are conservatives uh, would like to hope that this is a conservative win. Uh, Mike Pence, who's the VP, is a conservative. Uh, Rance Priebus, who's going to be chief of staff, is a conservative. But we don't know what Donald Trump is. Um, Donald Trump was a liberal Democrat until not too long ago. He's been all over the map on a number of these questions. Uh, Steve Bannon's not a conservative in any conventional sense. And so trying to anticipate who's going to fill these slots at the Department of Ed or anywhere else in the administration, you know, either the reality is I think we're all going to have to wait and see. Um, and uh, frequently it's easy for people to kind of explain what they'd like to see is their analysis. And, you know, I, I don't think there's, I, think, I don't think a lot of the people um, who are sharing their thoughts have really good and reliable pipelines uh, to the Trump inner circle. Um, let's just leave it at that. Um, so we'll see. Um, that said, Catherine pointed out that I think it's a mistake to focus on Trump's narrow electoral victory as kind of the defining way to understand this election. Catherine pointed it out. Republicans are the strongest they've been at the state level in a century. Uh, they've got two. They've got two thirds of the uh, gubernatorial mansions. Uh, Dems have lost a thousand state legislative seats since 2008. Sixty percent of state legislative seats in the country are now held by Republicans. Catherine pointed out half the states in the country have unified Republican government. In Washington, uh, Republicans not only hold the Senate, but 2018 sets up to be a phenomenal election year for Republicans. Uh, they're only defending eight seats out of 33. Um, and in the House, usually, you, you, you know, usually uh, the, the presidential party has to anticipate backlash uh, in, the, in the midterms, except that it's also the fact that Republicans tend to be much more reliable about showing up in the midterms. So we'll couple that with the Senate advantage, Republicans on the Hill may not be out of line to be thinking about the likelihood that they have four years of unified control. Speaking of which, 
the last time Republicans had majorities in the House, majorities in the Senate, and the White House? 1928. If you remember, in 2000, the Senate was 50-50, and Cheney broke the vote until Jeffords switched. But the last time Republicans had majorities in both chambers and the White House was 1928. So the story here is not just what Trump wants to do, but that you have a relatively staunchly conservative uh, Republican Congress, which is, likely to, which is likely to push with the administration, and how those fights shake themselves out, we'll see. Um, as far as trying to interpret the Trump tea leaves, I'll just tell you what I've been telling journalists all year. Um, I think the mistake many have made is to interpret Trump, is to take Trump literally, but not seriously. I think that's backwards. I think that what folks should have been doing was taking Trump seriously, but not literally. Um, those of you who've covered the campaign know that the $20 billion figure for choice kind of came out of nowhere. Uh, you know that Trump's been all over on student loans. You know that... You know, I'm going to outlaw the Common Core. Who the heck knows where that came from? <clears throat> um, I think the right way to read these is I don't like Common Core. I do like school choice. I want to do something on higher ed. Um, by the way, how to interpret that? When you see names floated for Secretary of Education who were Common Core advocates, um, you know, of whatever stripe, um, I think that's likely to be one of the considerations against them when the Trump uh, Council caucuses that they're going to think, do we really want to go back to those, uh, you know, those house moms in Indiana and explain that we put somebody in the secretary's office who was out front supporting the Common Core? Um, that's, the, that's the way I would tend to think we ought to be interpreting kind of Trump uh, pledges. Um, as far as education on the agenda, you know, um, Louis Gavin both said, look, education me back. Think about the stuff Trump ran on, um, immigration, tax cuts. <clears throat> Uh, son of Stimulus, um, the Affordable Care Act, the Iran deal. Uh, these are big, heavy-hitting things that are going to take a lot of time and energy. Uh, there's a Supreme Court vacancy that's going to get a lot of attention early next year. Um, education is likely to be further back in the queue. Um, and one final thought. <coughs> um, I've been doing this in this town a long time. A lot of you guys know that. Uh, I, I've been in education for a quarter century now. I've been doing this stuff in D.C. for 14 years. Um, you know, a lot of smart people disagree with me, but I've written books with reputable presses. I've written articles. Yet when I talk about the kinds of stuff that people say was su were such hot button issues in the election, uh, question of how do you deal with illegal immigrants in schools, uh, issues of how race uh, focused education policy ought to be. Uh, questions of whether speech codes are trampling civil rights, questions of whether Office of Civil Rights directives on Title IX enforcement are creating kangaroo courts on campuses. I have rarely found even my thoughtful friends on the left uh, willing to entertain this as a legitimate and constructive discourse. I can't tell you how many times in the last eight years I've been dismissed as a racist, a xenophobe, a homophobe. So I've got to tell you, I think part of the challenge is education in particular is so far to the left of America in general that things which are deemed simply out of the realm of imagination in education, horrible things to say, horrific ideas to entertain, aren't seen that way by a lot of our fellow Americans. And I've got to tell you, um, you may not like me, and that's totally cool. It's a free country. But when you were denouncing Mitt Romney and George W. Bush, as racists and xenophobes and war criminals, for a lot of people on the right and even in the middle, those words cease to have any meaning. And they then say, you know what? Well, Donald Trump seems obnoxious and boorish and does a lot of things that strike me as enormously difficult. But you know what? He's not going to worry when the New York Times calls him a racist. And we need somebody who's not going to be intimidated out of talking about some of these things that we think need to be talked about and advocated. So I would just argue all of us in this space um, maybe to take the advice of Secretary Clinton and check some of our own implicit biases about what we think of as acceptable and permissible um, ideas and conversations to have when it relates to schools and colleges and early childhood.